Disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed in Radio DMG may or may not be the views and opinions of the DMGI's family of sites. All music used in this podcast is the property of whoever made it, and no copyright infringement is intended. God bless this albatross, and hold on tight for the awesome you are about to receive. It's got the beta K. And welcome to Radio DMG. I am your host, Philip Wesley, the Mile High Mouth, and here we are on November 14th, 2011. So, today's episode of Radio DMG, our 20th episode, sort of. Actually, it's not really our 20th. We're actually like at 22 or 23, but um, this is our 20th official episode. And we're not doing anything to celebrate, sorry. So, but what we are doing is we're going to do some more NDK audio, but first we're going to do some newsity. We've got just a slight bit of newsity, and then we're going to have the interview with uh, Chris Kaysen and the interview with Tony Oliver. I have a lot more interviews, but I'm going to stretch them out because, hey, content, why not? So it's going to be a shorter episode than normal, but uh, hey, gives you something a little bit more palatable than last week's, uh, say, two-hour-long episode. And besides, I'm tired, it's a Monday, and there's a lot of Super Mario 3D Land to be played. Oh, yes, Super Mario 3D Land, which came out, by the way, this uh, weekend, um, this Sunday, the 13th. But let's get into the newsity, and we'll discuss that. And welcome back to Radio DMG, and let's go ahead and start the newsy. And I do say the word and a lot. I'm okay with it. So, here's what happened in the newsy. I guess, before we get into that, I might as well just tell you what I've been playing, because, eh, why not? A lot of other podcasts do, and... Okay, I've just been playing a lot of Super Mario Brothers, um... Super Mario Brothers, New Super Mario Brothers, and Super Mario 3D Land, which is pretty great, actually. Um, pretty good stuff. You'll probably see a review of it by fr- on Friday or Saturday, so look forward to that. <clears throat> so, anyways, here's what happened. Oh, we put up some video of these too. Super Mario 3D launch, 3D launched, and uh, there was a big event in New York about it. Lots of people showed up. And um, we don't know what the first day sales are yet. However, there is a group that wasn't so happy with the launch of Super Mario 3D Land. Um, Popular attention whores, PETA, launched an anti-Super Mario 3D Land um, flash game, stating that Mario is encouraging killing Tanukis, T-A-N-U-K-I, for their fur, despite the fact that the Tanuki suit is spelled T-A-N-O-O-K-I, and specifically references the mystical creature with magical balls, and not the raccoon dog fox thing in Japan. Also, one thing to note is that the Tanuki, T-A-N-U-K-I, is listed as a least concern by the IUCN. The IUCN is the International Union for Conservation of Nature. An LC rating means that the Tanuki is pretty much a pest with no danger to it at all. It is the Japanese equivalent of that pesky raccoon that knocks over your trash can. It is the large-scale, nasty biting equivalent of the mice or rats that made their way into your basement to eat your books and laundry. I mean, PETA themselves actually kill more animals every year than vets. Remember, people, deer in the United States are a least concerned status. They are pests, and they taste good. So kill Bambi and his mother, and eat them with a side of fries. Mmm... On a side note, polar bears are a vulnerable status on that list, meaning they could be endangered if there were a huge natural disaster, but right now, the accounts of polar bears show that they are close to becoming not threatening and then least concerned in the near future. Personally, they are pests to the Inuits. Well, delicious, but also murderous pests. I just wish there was a place I could buy polar bear meat, which I would eat with a side of venison while playing Super Mario 3D Land and drinking some wonderful red wine, red wine that's red like blood. I would raise my glass of fine red wine and a toast to Ingrid Newkirk, Bill Maher, Peter Singer, and Ira Einhorn. Because, you know, nothing goes better with wine than toasting complete idiots. People just need to remember that Ingrid Newkirk is the person who, uh, well, Peter Singer is the guy who uh, wrote a... um, 
He wrote a paper back in the 70s about the personhood of animals. You see, these are people who want um, personhood for your dogs and cats, but not for an unborn child. Hmm, there's kind of a disconnect there. But anyways, Peter Singer would teach that humans were a bit of a parasite on the earth and they're not naturally supposed to be there, were an evolutionary mistake, and that animals are infinitely superior. He helped found both PETA with Ingrid Newkirk, who's a disciple of his, and um, another group called the Animal Liberation Front. The Animal Liberation Front is a place that would blow up a child care center if they owned hamsters. These are the people who are violent extremists. They spike trees, which leads to damage logging equipment and death. They've bombed laboratories and animal testing facilities. They're just bad people. Ira Einhorn is a person who um, he helped found Earth Day, but he's also referred to as the unicorn killer because he killed and maimed and, well, yeah, he murdered, maimed, and sexually uh, oh, horrible things to several women. And he was convicted of that. And he's the founder of Earth Day, which is why I don't celebrate it. Because why would I want to celebrate a holiday that celebrates the ideals of a murderer, of a madman, of a terrible person? I throw Bill Maher into that because um, this is a guy who once said, in U.S. Magazine, February 1999, <clears throat> this is an actual quote from Bill Maher, and I would think twice about ever watching his shows or supporting him in any way. He said this, <clears throat> To those people who say, my father is alive because of animal experimentation, I say, yeah, well, good for you. This dog died so your father could live. Sorry, but I'm just not behind that kind of a trade-off. These are sick people, and... They're out there just trying to get our attention and try and prevent us from playing a good game. So you know what? Let's not pay them any attention. You see, when you don't pay attention to something, it may get louder and louder and louder and more and more annoyed. The thing is, we give PETA too much press time. I've given it way too much time just talking about it in the news, city. But you have to realize these are sick, sick people. And when they're not occupying Wall Street, they're out there trying to get you to, to stop playing Super Mario 3D Land. So my opinion is raise your 3DS high and bask in your freedom to play Super Mario 3D Land. Go out and buy a 3DS and play Super Mario 3D Land. It is a good game. It is worth your time. Buy multiple copies of it so everyone can play. It is a great game. So... There you have it. That's pretty much the news today. We're going to go into our first feature th theme, and then we're going to have a uh, musical interlude, which is actually from a um, from the musical group 6955. Um, let's see. Which one are we going to... We'll probably play, what, play something off of their... Uh, okay, let me bring up my stuff over here. Do, 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 do. Do, do, do. Hmm. Looking for my music... Oh, there it is. Yeah, there is a, um, a 6955 EP called Nintendo Museum, and we're probably going gonna to play one of their tracks off of that album between our two interviews. So we're going to start out with the Chris Kaysen interview, which um, there's a little bit of politics in it. Honestly, remember, here at DMG Ice, we have none of the opinions expressed in here are... Um, I guess representative of our overall feel. I mean, if I say something, I will. Mo I most likely stand by it. But if a guest says something, no, they don't represent us. So that said, this has nothing to do with Rick Perry adding me on his LinkedIn. Okay. Although I thought that was really weird. Um, there are people who are attached to my LinkedIn that um, I'm a little concerned on how they found me or why they added me. But yeah, um, remember, our political views are not necessarily the views of our, of our guests, so there is a little bit of politics in it. But yeah, there's also um, an interview with Tony Oliver. Most people don't know who he is, but he's actually the voice of uh, Rick Hunter from Robotech. And he's, oh, just listen to it. The interview's pretty good. Um, you'll be surprised what it is he did. We have, um, I mean, if you, if you were like me and you grew up with Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, 
you got a lot you got you got to thank this guy it's pretty cool but those are our interviews we're going to get to those in our features and then we'll be right back here to say good night so see you on the flip side everybody this is gluttony and you're listening to radio dmg delicious <laughs> And welcome back to Radio DMG. I'm your host, Philip Wesley, the Mile High Mouth, and I'm here at Nondescon 2011 with... Chris Kaysen. And Chris, who are you and what do you do? Well, <laughs> I'm a voice actor and director and writer for Funimation Entertainment, although I also do some other projects that are away from Funimation, like uh, different video games and things like that. Um, I suppose, uh, in terms of voice work, I would be most known for... Uh, Gluttony from Full Metal Alchemist, or Mr. Popo and Chen Shenhan from DBZ, or Holy Roman Empire from Italia, or, um, uh, well, stuff like that. <laughs> I always just keep going, but yeah. I didn't know that you were the Mile High Mouth, by the way. Oh, it's just, uh, kind of a moniker that's been added to the, uh, show as we go along, because when I used to do these before, um, they'd refer to me on other podcasts as the Mouth from the Midwest, the Mouth <laughs> of the Midwest, and I was like, well, I moved out over here, I guess this works now. <laughs> yeah, it still works, still applies. Mm-hmm. So, um, how did you get into voice acting? Well, I was an actor. I mean, the short answer that I have is that I was an actor living in Dallas, and Funimation was built in my backyard. That's the short, the shortest answer possible. Um, I was was an actor living in Dallas, and I had a friend who uh, said, "Hey, they're actually what he said was, hey, they're auditioning for cartoons in Fort Worth. You should do it.' I did. It was a lot of fun, and I said, "Okay, fine." And I go into this building, and I look at a bunch of crazy-looking characters, and I read for you know, five or six of them, and then I go home and leave, not thinking anything about it, and then I get a call about a week later, um, hey, we want you to come in, you got a couple of parts, you're playing Mr. Popo and Chen Shinhan for a show called Dragon Ball, Ball Z, and I thought, okay, so uh, not knowing what that would really mean later, and I went in to record, and, and I left thinking, well, ah, this would be fun for a while, it'll probably never go anywhere, and uh, whoops, was I wrong, um, you know, it, it just exploded. And I'm so thankful that it did. So, You've done some video game work. What video games have you worked on? Well, let's see. I've done a lot of uh, games that were tied into the anime uh, that I worked on. I've done some uh, Full Metal games and some uh, DBZ games, a Yu Hakusho game, um, Donkey Kong Country. I worked on the Ghostbusters game. Uh, that was really cool because... Um, I was at a, at a con and I had, uh, and someone came to the line and they wanted me to sign the cover of the Ghostbusters game. And I looked and Dan Aykroyd had already signed the cover. So I thought, wow, I'm signing next to Dan Aykroyd's name, that's so cool. Um, so that one, and then um, I got to play guitar on Guitar Hero 3, that was kind of neat. That's not voice related, but it was kind of fun. And then I have another really big game that I'm unfortunately sitting on that I can't talk about until spring of next year. Hmm. So. Not related to Donkey Kong Country, of course, right? Not at all. Okay. No. So, in Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Country Returns, or the original one? The uh, one on the Wii? The most recent one. Yeah. yeah. So, what voice did you do in Donkey Kong Country Returns? Well, mostly, they had a lot of creatures in it. I do a lot of creature voices almost uh, exclusively, it seems. I did um, different creatures. Most notably, there's a huge uh, attacking... Oh, gosh. Was it attacking hawk or bird or something like that? I can't remember the character name, but... Um, I did that. For, I was just screeching for hours on end, so that was pretty fun. Can you give us a creature noise? <laughs> any random creature noise? Uh, any random creature noise? My gosh, let's see. Uh, there's a dog. Okay, <laughs> I guess that works. Sure, well, it's Whitey. There's Whitey the dog from Shin Chan, for example. Oh. So, um, you said you did acting before you got into voice acting. Um, what was it? What did you do? What was it? Stage acting. Stage, uh, stage acting. Stage acting, um... I was in an uh, improv and comedy troupe, and that's where I met, by the way, the guy, the friend who told me to, to audition uh, was my friend in, in uh, the comedy troupe, and his name was Mike McFarland, and he went on to be in DBZ as well, and also direct, and I mean, he's, he's still, he does tons of things. Um, so yeah, it was definitely that, um, and I did some commercial work, but mostly a lot of stage stuff before um, the voice work started happening, and it's, it's just a weird thing that my first job and voice work or voice acting happened to be Dragon Ball Z. It's kind of a, a rarity. Uh, of course, that's back when the, the talent, um, I should say, the um, uh, the talent list or the, the actor roster um, for Funimation was probably, it was much smaller because they were just getting started. And now we have an actor database there 
of at least 400 people. So it's gotten a little cutthroatier, I suppose, or a little harder to break into. Um, with all the new people, um, in in that it's kind of a little. Do you have any dirt on any of them? Like we've had, we've done a bit of we did an interview already with uh, um, Patrick Seitz and um, oh, um, Dad, what the, the, I forgot his name. Ah, oh, Todd Abercorn. Mm -hmm. um, and also like Jeremy Lee and Kyler Bear. Um, any interesting stories about any of them? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> one of the things you learn as a director is the art of diplomacy. Um, I would say that because, you know, an actor, particularly an anime, you know, they come in one at a time to record, of course. So they come in, there's a director and an engineer in the room, and that's it. Um, and so they, it, it's very possible that an actor could come in, record an entire show, which is either, you know, 12 to 25 or 6 episodes or whatever it is, and never meet the person that they kill or kiss or, or you know, their mom or whatever it is in the show. But in the case of the director, you have maybe five or six actors coming in per day. So you get to meet all of them. And, and so you, you can find out a little bit about their lives and, and all kinds of stuff. So um, <laughs> I guess I'm choosing to, uh, in a self-preservation move, I'm choosing to uh, keep, keep tight lips so that they keep coming back. <laughs> so, yeah. So um, where did you draw where did you draw the inspiration for your creature voices or say like gluttony? Gluttony's got an interesting voice. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean a lot of it in, in that case, that was me as a voice actor, uh, and I wasn't directing myself. It was directed by um, Mike McFarlane and Colin Clinkenbeard, and uh, I mean the first season, and a, a lot of it was based on on the Japanese um, approach. And we just tried to emulate that as close as we could. Of course, in the case of Full Metal Alchemist, unlike some other shows, the Japanese um, um, representatives required final say on all the characters. So once we in-house figured out who we wanted it to be, they then shipped that off to Japan, who then made their final, or who agreed or disagreed with what was selected. So I guess they thought that I was just doing it as close to, you know, as close to the original gluttony as possible. Although it is funny, you know, I, that could almost be its own panel at a con, which is uh, jobs that voice actors didn't get. Because, for, I mean, I auditioned for Gluttony, but I, that wasn't the only character I auditioned for. We usually auditioned for at least three parts per show. So I think it's kind of interesting. These are the parts that we have, but it would be interesting to see the parts that we didn't quite get, because everyone has a story like that. So that's kind of neat. Hmm. Now, um... I'm gonna. This is gonna be a little bit heavy because tomorrow is September 11th, mm -hmm. the 10th anniversary of the of, of the uh, event. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think. Um, do you remember where you were? I do actually. I remember, I remember where I was. I remember um, I was driving out to. I was in Louisiana driving out to a, a gig, a, a performing, an acting job, and I remember. Of course, it was shut down. But we, by the time I got there, it had all happened, and so you know everything. The whole world had felt stopped on that day, and I remember seeing Air Force One flying overhead, actually, and uh, it was a very sobering, somber. I mean, I, I don't. I hope to never. It was an experience that I'd never felt before, and I hope to never feel again because it was just. Uh, I mean, it felt like you just didn't know what was going to happen. It was a very uh, frightening time. Um, so yeah, I, I remember it very well. And I also think that it's great, by the way, that a decade later, our country has not experienced anything like that up to this point. You know, I think that's a testimony to a lot of people working very hard to ensure that that's the case. So, uh, yeah, I, I do remember that day very well and, and, uh, hope to never, obviously, hope to never, uh, hope that anyone shouldn't go through that again. So... On a slightly light, on a lighter note, um, since you've done video game work, and that's usually in LA, and animation work, which is usually in Texas, <laughs> yeah. um, what, um, how, how hard is it to get a job between, say, California or Texas, which is a right-to-work state? Oh, uh, well, I have done some video games in Texas, too. Um, the ones in, it, it depends on the, on the game, because some games in California you can do uh, that are not unionized, and some are, most are, um, it just depends. I, I mean, I, I'm not a member of the unions, of course, because I am from Texas, but um, I guess I've just been, <laughs> been lucky so far, but there could come a time when I would have to, you know, um, if 
if I do enough games in California, I would have to make that decision to become a union member, and I'd have to weigh if it was worth it. And I hope that the answer would be that it was worth it, because that, that would mean that I'm working on a lot of games. So that would, because I mean, there's so much fun to work on. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm certainly prepared to do that, because, I mean, uh, the video game, the anime industry right now is kind of in flux. It, it's not, it's funny, there, there are more cons, it seems, every year. First year cons, I've been to quite a few this year alone, first year cons, and, and then, but anime itself is sort of, like, the Japanese output of anime itself is decreasing, yet there are more cons than ever. So, um, you have that going on, yet video games are really thriving. And so, and many of them are out of California, and, and I would love to be more of a, even more of a part of that. So, Well, I'm going to have to throw this one out, because you live in Texas, right? Mm -hmm. And I haven't thrown this one out yet to a lot of the other people living there in Texas. But oh, good. what do you think of Rick Perry? <sighs> be there's, honest. There's a, well, okay. I will only okay. be honest. <laughs> there's okay, a good, movie. Good. Here's my thing about Rick Perry. Well, they say no politics, no religion, but I'll, I'll make an exception in this particular case. There's a movie, and a, there's a book by Stephen King called The Dead Zone. And there's also a movie made from the book of The Dead Zone with uh, Christopher Walken as, as the, the hero. And it's about a man who can shake your hand, and he can, he's jolted, and he can see into that person's future. So like if the person's going to be a millionaire one day, he can shake their hand and know that one day that person will be a millionaire. Well, he, there's a guy running for local mayor, some small political office, smaller political office, and he shakes his hand, and he finds out that that man is going to one day bring forth... Armageddon itself, and he tracks this guy's career, and at the end of the movie or book, we see that the same man ends up running for president, and he knows that he's going to bring upon the end of the world, and he tries to assassinate him, and he himself, spoiler alert, he's assassinated, he dies at the end, so he dies without being able to get his message out. Here's my message. <laughs> Run, don't walk. Uh, I'm, I'm not a Rick Perry fan. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was all, like, he's like the dead is... zone. I'm like, okay, I don't think he's a... Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's my long-winded answer of saying uh, no no good. No uh, good. Not a big fan. No, not at all. Yeah, it's like I didn't really drag too much politics into these aside from asking about 9-11. Um, one question I've also thrown out here, actually, um, considering the earthquake, um, that happened in Japan with the resulting tsunami. Mm -hmm. Where do you think our memory of that will be in the next five or ten years? What can we do to keep that memory? Because it's a very important for Japan to keep that memory fresh. Because sometimes here in America we tend to have somewhat of a uh, a um, ADD approach to our memory, and it's surprising that September 11th has 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 kept as relevant as it has over these last 10 years, um, how can we keep what happened in Japan relevant? Well, um, that's one of those things that I suppose that's, I may be mixing metaphors, but I believe that's a butterfly effect where if a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil, it rains in Wisconsin or something to that effect, where we're, which is to say we're all uh, interconnected. And uh, that's one really interesting thing about one of the cool things about traveling so much and doing a lot of these conventions is that you get to meet a lot of different people from all over and you see how dependent we are on each other and how one thing does affect another. Uh, that said, I think um, uh, it seems like you know there have been great efforts to try to help out Japan, obviously. I, in fact, I think this very con is responsible for raising an incredible amount of money for that. Um, in terms of of remembering, um, you know, I certainly hope people do, but at the same time, it's one of those really unfortunate sort of natural disasters that, um, unlike a terrorist act, for example, um, it, it, it seems almost impossibly, un I don't know how you would prevent such a thing from happening, you know, and then the after effects. Um, all I can say is that, um, in terms of remembering, I guess we. I'm not. I'm not sure the best way to do so. I suppose. Um, hmm. That's a head scratcher, because the most anyone could do initially, of course, is just to uh, to donate um, a little bit of money for the relief, of course, and then in terms of of remembering. Um, 
I don't know if... I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure about that answer. I'm a little stumped because um, I'm sure there are a lot of people who would choose to uh, not remember that that happened to them. Um, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. I, I don't know if it's something that... Uh, um, uh, I'm not sure that's something that everybody would want want to to remember. I don't know if they're going to have some kind of memorial. I don't know if they're going to have some kind of anniversary. I don't know what they're going to do, but I know that it's definitely in America's best interest to um, think globally versus nationally. Although I have to say, I think part of the problem, if it is, well, it is a problem. Part of the problem that uh, America has is that it's such, it's so populated, with so it's such a large landmass and so populated that, um, you know, many people live, born and die in the same city, and they never really get out of that. So I think it's easy to kind of have tunnel vision. But, um, you know, whether it's um, donating money outside of America or seeing how the politics in one country affects this country, I think it's great to be globally minded, for sure. Speaking of tunnel vision, I've noticed something at a lot of anime conventions where a lot of people have a lot of energy, they're very outspoken, very... The opposite is shy at conventions, but when they go out into the real world like school or work or their everyday life, they tend to clam up to get that little tunnel vision to get into a little bit of a shell. Do you have any advice for helping people get out of that? Well, I think that's one of the great things about conventions, or anime conventions specifically, is that finally these are people who everybody gets to meet like-minded people. And they say the number one psychological need of human beings is to belong. And I think that's what's so great about them. Because, you know, they have guests, and I'm one of them, and that's great. But really, uh, it's about the attendees, of course, and they would like to interact with each other and meet each other, and that's what's so great. Um, if you're asking advice on how to become more extroverted... Is that extroverted, yes. Um, wow, I guess it would be that... Um, I mean, you know... That's just, I guess it's sort of like telling an addict to just say no. I mean, it's harder, it's easier said than done. But I think um, part of being, going from introvert to extroverted is maybe the fear that of rejection, the fear that someone's not going to like you for you or, or listen to you. But in my travels, I've found that that's not the case, that, that uh, you know, if you believe in the good in people in general, they're, people are open to you and your ideas, and, and I think it's, it's worth trying. You know, because the rewards are greater than not trying. So, and also, there's the theory that everybody has something. Everybody you meet has something new to teach you, even if it's what not to do. <laughs> so it's worth exploring. So, I would I would say, uh, cut back a little bit on the fear and just um, get out there and meet people. And I think it's it's a, you'll be greatly rewarded by trying it. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for this interview. Oh sure. Um, this is uh, Philip Wesley, The Mile I'm Out, and I'm here with... Chris Kaysen. And we're at NDK 2011. Thank you very much for the interview. Thank you. This is Min May. You're listening to Radio DMG. Oh, Rick. This is Rick Hunter, and you're listening to Radio DMG... Oh, Min May. And welcome back to Radio DMG. I'm your host, Philip Wesley, the Mile High Mouth, and I'm here with... Tony Oliver. And we're at Non-Descon 2011. So, Tony Oliver, what is it you do? Well, I'm a, I'm a voice actor. Mm -hmm. I have been for most of my life. Uh, I'm also a director and a producer, and sometimes writer. Actually, anything someone will pay me to do, I'll do, within mm -hmm. reason. <laughs> So you've voice acted in um, Robotech, a couple other things, but you've also produced, um, what was that show you produced? I'm trying to remember. Like, uh, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Ah. So how, how was, um, when were you approached with the idea of bringing over a Sentai film, a Sentai genre film um, show, to the United States? Well, I was working as a staff producer at Sabat Entertainment, and um, I was part of the, uh, they, they, at the time they developed kind of a development brain trust. Whenever they had an idea, they would bring some of us up, and we'd, we'd hash it out. It was kind of my turn. It was a bit of the luck of the draw. And I went up, and, and Haim Saban uh, showed me and the executive, uh, Ellen Levy, Levy Sarnoff, who was there. He showed us this weird show with people in spandex jumping around and big latex monsters destroying Tokyo, and said, uh, and explained what he wanted to do. He explained this, uh, I want to make an American show around this and take out all the footage that looks like Japan and make it look American. 
what do you think? And, and I don't know if I said it or thought, but I said, I, I think you're out of your mind. Um, but uh, it was his idea, and they've been trying to do something like this for years. Um, and so we just, we, we cut up the footage, took out anything that wasn't Asian, and just kind of slapped it all together, all the explosions and the fights, through a rock and roll soundtrack and showed it to a bunch of kids, and they went crazy. And so that's how the show was born. So my job was to kind of do... Since I had an anime background, kind of figure out how to blend the American and the Japanese show together, so it made one cohesive show. Mm. I was the head writer for the first three seasons too. So, since you've worked with Carl Masick, did you kind of steal some of his little ideas, like what he did with Robotech? Well, no, no, no. I mean, Carl, Carl's a genius, first of all, and, and that's not something I am. But um, uh, what I did take from Carl is 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 this notion that when you're telling a story, you have to tell the story. Completely, there has to be some depth. There has to be some fun to it. Um, um, Carl was, an, was a consummate storyteller, and I learned a lot working with him on how that happens and how how a story needs to sweep through, especially when you're doing a story based on footage that you didn't create, <laughs> which uh, Robotech and the way he pulled those three shows together to make that work. So no, I didn't take anything from that because it's a completely different kind of show. But I did learn a lot working with him, and, and um, uh, he was uh, that was the first TV series I ever worked on was Robotech, and so. So it's more the education, the experience that I was able to bring into play into that. Do you prefer working with animation or live action? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like it all. I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm, you know, I'm a. I was a theater geek when I was young, and so I, I love working in all the genre. I, I do. I haven't done live action in quite a while. I'm, I'm kind of itching to do it again. Um, Animation is a lot of fun because you have no limitations, and especially now with the ability to do some of the 3D, 3D animation that's available at relatively low cost, it's, uh, you know, whatever you can imagine can be done now. And I also do theater. I, I, still, uh, I still direct. I just did a, directed a musical for uh, Hollywood French Festival this last year. Oh. So it's, I like working in all the genres. Uh, what was the uh, theater production that you directed? Um, it's uh, from the for the tribe productions. I directed uh, a show called Working, which was uh, based on a Studs Terkel novel that Stephen Schwartz wrote the music for, and James Taylor and a few other people. And we did it for the Hollywood Fringe Festival this year as part of the tribe productions. So is that one kind of like how to succeed in business without ever, without, yeah, without really trying? No, actually, is it's it a, it's more? an anthology. Studs Terkel was a is a, a Chicago writer who mm -hmm. went around the country talking to regular middle class working people about their lives and wrote a book on it, which uh, which as they told their own stories. And then Stephen Schwartz turned that into a musical where there's these monologues and songs. Uh, where people talk about normal working life and what's that like? It's very poignant. It's 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 uh, it's. I mean, there's some funny parts to it, but it's definitely not a comedy. Mm, definitely not. Um, since you said you did a lot of theater before you started voice acting and such, um, do you remember the first theatrical production you were in? The first theatrical production that I was in that I remember. Um, I was a teenager. It was uh, the teenage drama workshop. Were you talking about professional or otherwise? Oh, either other. Uh, like the actually the earliest one. Yeah, the Not earliest one that stuff. I mean, I did some little stuff in junior high school. But the first big production I was in was with the teenage drama workshop at Cal State Northridge, which still exists. They still mm -hmm. run it. It's called Tadwa. Anybody who lives in that area, um, and they um, and I did a Midsummer Night's Dream Shakespeare. I played Lysander and. Uh, and our, the woman who played Puck uh, was is named Mara Winningham, who's now an Academy Award, Emmy Award winning actress. So we had a great cast uh, of people. Wendy Jo Sperber was in it. She eventually went on to have her own show on Fox and do a lot of Spielberg films. And um, So, yeah, it was kind of a, a nice breeding ground for, for us young performers. <laughs> <laughs> so working with, like, let's go back to Power Rangers for mm -hmm. a bit. Um, what, was it, um, what was it like working with, like, Jai Young Bosch or... Um, Actually, uh, can you give us like an embarrassing story about about them? Because like uh, I, I've met some of them. I've met Amy Jo Johnson. I've met um, Johnny Young Bosch. I've met a few of these people. Give us some dirt. Well, no, I'm not going to give you dirt. But Aww. but okay. I, but I will tell you that um, Johnny's got one of my favorite lines in all the Power Rangers uh, episodes and movies, and it's in the film. And it's when he's given his 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 coin, and he looks at it and goes. I'm a frog, <laughs> and I I was there when they shot it, and I about I had to I just fell out, about fell out of my chair, and the reason is is that he was actually disappointed as a as a human you know as a rec, as an actor that he, he traveled all this way and he gets to be a frog he wanted to be a mastodon or something big you know but he's gonna be, and I thought that was just very funny. <laughs> Did you write that line for it? No, no, the the film was written by uh, 20th Century Fox writers. Oh, okay. I was just there consulting. Consulting, yeah, because you'd worked on the series. Yeah, 
So what was the idea of, uh, um, what was the impetus behind um, injecting uh, Bulk and Skull into that as the comic relief? Was there anything like, like them in the Japanese version? No, and that's why we did it. I mean, part of it was to Americanize it a little bit more. Part of it was because the Japanese Sentai series are very serious. I mean, there's, not a, there's some comedy, but they, they uh, like in the current, the current series, Samurai, in, in, the, in the Japanese show, a couple of the characters are somewhat comic. But that's not the, the archetype of a superhero in American culture. They tend to be serious or straightforward. Plus, quite frankly, um, uh, comedy takes a, a higher skill of acting than, than drama does. And, and uh, we were more concerned with the physicality of the Power Rangers and their abilities to do their own stunts and things like that than we were with any depth of acting. I mean, there was only when the original cast I think it was only three of the original six cast actually had any acting experience at all before they walked in front of those cameras. So, um, so we wanted to inject some funny, some funny into it because a kids show needs to be funny. And Chaim Saban tasked us with making quote a live action cartoon. That's the way he wanted it to play. So we brought Bulk and Skull in, and actually in the original pilot, Bulk was the sidekick, and Skull was a little bit more serious, um, a different actor and a little bit more serious, and uh, it just didn't work. But he was so good and engaging, so we, we dropped the guy who was playing Skull, we made Bulk the, the, the lead guy, and we let actually let Paul Schreier pick his own sidekick. He did the auditions for his sidekick, and he's the one that picked Jason Narby. Ah, uh, that's excellent. Yeah. I, think they, I think that was a good idea to give him that leeway on there. Yeah. Um, there's a type of um, method acting called enforced method acting. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's used in animation where they don't tell you what's going to happen in the script. Sometimes it's used in, used in uh, live action where... Uh, they, they keep stuff hidden so the gen, there's genuine shock mm -hmm. on audio. Um, have you ever used that? And what do you feel about that? Do you feel it's dishonest to the actors? Um, the answer to that is yes, no. Mm -hmm. um, I've had it used on me, and in fact, uh, the first time it was used on me was in Robotech. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know Roy Foker was going to die until I read it in the script standing in front of me. I was in the booth doing the scenes when I, well, oh my god, he died? And which at the time I'd never seen, there was not, you know, animation, cartoons, people don't die. And here's the main character dying in episode 18 or whatever it was. And it was shocking to me and it was so effective that I use it now sometimes with actors. I, I did it last with, uh, with, um, with uh, Kyle Hebert in, uh, in Gurren Lagann. And that uh, we didn't tell him that he was going to die. <laughs> 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 and he's in the booth going, Oh, I'm gonna die! Aww. <laughs> you know? Well, he didn't realize that the character continued on, even though he was dead. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a thing. I don't think it's dishonest. I think, in certain circumstances, it's actually a good thing because you want there's a certain level of honesty you have to get in a performance, and and uh, sometimes it, 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 when you're in a booth situation and it's just you and a microphone, it's a little, you know, it's, it's a little hard to to put yourself in that place, and if you can throw a few little things at actors. Um, as long as they know that's what you're going to do, um, I think that's fine. I think that works. You don't. I don't believe in that on a stage, mm. live in front of an audience. No. no. Going back to the stage, um, have you been? Have um, what musicals have you been in? And have you been in any Sondenheim musicals? Um, I've done God a number of musicals. I can't even remember. I've done uh, in the last few years. I did because I still do theater, even though um, that's kind of a more of a hobby for me now. Um, I've done working. I've done. I did the Fantastics last year at the Hollywood French Festival. I was played one of the dads. Um, I've done My Fair Lady. I've done um, Guys and Dolls. Uh, a couple of original musicals. One that I helped write called um, Play On. Um, I've done some Sondheim, but never a full Sondheim musical. I was in a Sondheim review, mm. where I realized that Sondheim hates singers. <laughs> it's the most <laughs> difficult stuff to learn how to play, how to do. And uh, but yeah, I love Sondheim musicals. Kind of like the whole Into the Woods. If you could pick oh, one, God, which that's one would you be Oh, God, that's so hard to sing. Uh, <laughs> if you um, could pick one of his, which would it be? I'm not sure. Um, I, I, uh, I like A Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, a Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, a Little Night Music I thought was really good. I'd like to do Into the Woods at some point. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was cast in Assassins, but then the, can the production was canceled. So I thought that was going to be interesting. It's controversial. You know, a bit controversial. And we may do Company next year. Excellent. So, so, uh, so I don't know. I may get to do it yet. Maybe you'll get to the part where you're like, "Marry me a little." That one. Yeah, I'm a little old for that part, but no, yeah. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> um, since we got since uh, this this will be like our final question. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Out of all your all of your work, 
that you've done, um, what would you want people to remember you the most for? Um, I don't know. I, I, that's a good question. I'm not done. Not done yet. So um, I, I don't think I've done the thing yet that I want to be remembered for, but uh, we'll see. I just want to be remembered for being a good, honest performer who told good stories and, and directed well and, uh, and had some integrity in his business dealings and in his creative art. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's, that would be it. Okay. Thank you for the interview today. Can I plug something? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, um, one of the things that I'm doing uh, a lot right now is I'm, I'm teaching teaching voice acting classes all across the country. It's called Adventures in Voice Acting. In fact, I'm going to do a mini workshop here at, in on Descon right after we're done with this. Oh. And, um, and uh, they, are, uh, they are professional workshops, full day workshops, eight hours. I have a beginning and intermediate and advance where I teach fundamentals of voice acting, how to do anime, how to do games, how to audition, and how to develop characters. And um, I'm doing them all across the country. We're based in Los Angeles, but I do them in New York and Chicago, and uh, hopefully here in Denver someday. And uh, if anybody's interested, they can go to www.adventuresinvoiceacting.com. All one word? Uh, yep. All one word. All right. Uh, thank you for your time today. This has been Philip Wesley, The Mile High Mouth, and I've been here at Nondescon 2011 with... Tony Oliver. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. And that's how the interview went down with, um, well, both interviews. The musical interlude we had in the middle is Museum Number no. 1 by the Chip tune group 6955 unfortunately it's kind of hard to find their music these days because their official site is sometimes up sometimes not up just do a uh, duck duck go search on them oh by the way well we don't have they're not a sponsor or anything but i would actually recommend people check out um duck duck go that's d-u-c-k d-u-c-k g-o dot com you can do secure searches they don't bubble you. Look it up, actually, on there. They've got a little bit where they talk about it. Apparently, Google and Google Plus saves all of your search history and then tailors your search results to match your ideo or what they perceive your ideology to be. And I believe that's a bit unfair. And mean that there's there's something really really off about that it may have to do something with that google x project that they're working on we don't know i know google's um slogan is don't be evil but you can't help but wonder if they are so i'd rather go ahead and trust my search results to feathered friends at duckduckgo.com they've even got a firefox um plugin which is what you should be using honestly if you're not browsing dmgice.com on a tablet, you should be using Firefox. Or if you're one of those people who's a personal computer challenged and you have like a Macintosh project product, use Safari. It still looks good on that. Please don't use Internet Explorer. It looks kind of awful on that for some reason, which is really, really weird because like ancient versions of Internet Explorer or even Mozilla, like the ancient Mozilla Netscape stuff, still displays the website correctly. However, I mean, even Hot Java displays the website correctly. But um, Internet Explorer doesn't. It's so weird. But yeah, that's our show for today. Uh, we're a little bit under an hour. I understand that. But hey, we'll have more next week. Or any type of... We might have a New City episode this week if there's anything huge and breaking that shows up. But yeah, see you next week. See you. Yeah. See you next week. This is Philip Wesley, the Mile High Mouth, signing out for Radio DMG on November 14th, 2011. Good night. Morning, Maya.